The beating heart of West Africa lies without a doubt in Benin. It is a mysterious country, populated by strange gods and ghosts, where ancestral spirits reign over the fate of the living. This place is the link between life and death. Our spirits are hiding here. If this house disappears, our ancestors will disappear too, and they won't be able to do any more for us. Armed with a powerful spirituality, these men and women are fighting to protect their heritage. They are the Sentinels of Benin. An incessant buzz rises and falls but never stops. Porto Novo, the capital of Benin, wouldn't be the same without the toing and froing of its motorcycle taxis or Zemijan. Zemijan, meaning get me there fast in the fun language, is a popular form of transport, despite the threat they pose to passengers and pedestrians of both the two-legged and four-legged variety. Every morning, Ateni gets on his motorbike and crosses the city in search of customers. Hey, how are you? Yeah. Good. I want to go to that crossroads over there. How much do you charge? 200. Come on. Five litres, please. Here's your 200 francs. Okay. Thanks, bye. Give me five litres, I'm in a hurry. There's no oil in Benin, but Nigeria has vast reserves. Benin's unemployed buy cut price fuel on the other side of the border and bring it back here to sell. The service stations are too expensive. We Beninese, we can't afford it. Money's scarce in Benin. Life's not easy. I'm a farmer, but I have a family, and farming doesn't pay well enough to feed them all year around. So during the dry season, I run a taxi service. It helps us to make ends meet. What's good about this place is that Porto Novo is a cosmopolitan city that attracts people from all over Benin and even foreigners. There are lots of old colonial buildings, but also hotels and restaurants which bring together people from all over Africa and the rest of the world. I'm really proud of my city. Porto Novo, the fiefdom of the Goon and Yoruba peoples, has been enriched by numerous architectural influences over the course of its turbulent history. Before becoming French, it was a Portuguese trading post in the 18th century. Slaves were carted off to Brazil from here in their thousands. The majority of them were Muslim, and they took their god with them to South America. After the abolition of slavery, some of the slaves' descendants crossed back over the Atlantic to settle on the land of their ancestors. These Afro-Brazilians built this Baroque mosque by hand, modeled on Salvador Cathedral in Bahia. With just one difference, the great mosque is topped by a crescent instead of a cross. Here in Benin, the mix of architectural styles and the religious syncretism have never bothered anyone. Islam and Christianity have had no choice but to accept the presence of animist cults that are as old as Africa herself. What unites us all here is voodoo. As soon as I wake up in the morning, I start praying to my deities. Only after I've done that can I get on my motorbike and head out in search of customers. Benin is the birthplace of voodoo, with its 50 million followers worldwide. 
Practiced in secret, behind closed doors or in the open, such as here in this temple shaped like a termite mound, voodoo is a powerful and demanding master for its followers. Eteni is a high-ranking initiate. He plays a crucial role in his own voodoo community. Summoned for a ceremony, he leaves the city center to return to his village on the outskirts of Porto Novo. Voodoo has a pantheon of gods symbolizing the forces of nature. Ateni's village is protected by Revioso, the god of storms and lightning. Revioso, sometimes represented by a ram, is invoked several times a year by the villagers. If he appears, he will take possession of an initiate. Sukluno, the village's voodoo priest, leads the ceremony. He is assisted by cult leaders from the surrounding area. Oh, Kevioso, your children haven't come to worship you empty-handed. Have mercy on us and grant us longevity. May any enemy who decides to persecute us find you blocking their path. The sacrifices are made. Voodoo musicians signal to their deity that the ritual has been completed. Suddenly, it's all happening. Revioso has appeared. He has taken possession of a follower. Go away, you haven't been initiated. You can't touch him. Stand him up, stand him up and hold him, hold him. It is Atene, the taxi driver, who has only just arrived, but is already in a trance. He has grabbed hold of a villager and it has taken four people to free the man. Give him some water. The trance is dangerous. Only a few well-prepared initiates can serve as a receptacle for the powerful voodoo god. Atenye is one of them, and he plays this role in his community. But now that he is possessed, he has lost control of himself. Priests have dragged him to the sacred hut to prepare him for the rest of the ceremony. It's time for the celebrations to begin. They must drum, chant and dance with all their might to obtain the blessing of Revioso, who has appeared on earth among men. The purple loincloth, the color of lightning, and the straps on the costume symbolize the bonds between the possessed man and his god. Placing themselves under his protection, the faithful ask the deity for good health, good luck, and prosperity for their village. Despite all the cliches, voodoo is a benevolent religion for its initiates and the wider community.
Now that the spirit, the strength, and the soul of the lightning god has entered Athene's body, he no longer knows what is happening. If you meet him later, Athene will tell you that he doesn't know what happened. If you ask him and say to him, but you were dancing just now, he will just reply, Pff. For the Beninese, spirituality is very important, especially voodoo, because voodoo embraces rich and poor. It embraces young and old. Voodoo brings together the different strata of society. 92% of the Beninese practice voodoo, even those who claim to be religious. When they have problems, they turn to voodoo to solve them. The entire population belongs to this age-old secret cult. In order to understand the Beninese, you must take an interest in their spirituality, but also their geography. Situated in West Africa, Benin is a small, narrow country covering a surface area of 115,000 square kilometers. Its 10 million inhabitants are divided into 40 ethnic groups spread across the country. In the north, a swampy, hilly region populated by farmers and shepherds live Muslim nomads, such as the animist Somba or Fuller people. The south, with its Atlantic coast, has the greatest concentration of Beninese people, the majority of whom are Fon. The boggy plain is strewn with mangrove swamps, lagoons and lakes. Cotonou, the economic hub of Benin with its 700,000 inhabitants, stretches along the banks of Lake Nukwe, which is connected to the Atlantic by a long channel. On the other side of this lake, sheltered from the roar of the city, lives a singular group of people, the Tofanu, who have taken up residence in the lakeside village of Gonvier. Fifty thousand Tofanu live on the water's edge in Gonvier. They have their own language. Fishing is their only resource, and pirogues their only mode of transport. Baba Fuji, 65 years old, is a fisherman too. How are you kids? Working hard? Yes, thanks. Ah, I've finished for the day. Welcome. He divides his time between his two homes on stilts, each housing one of his two wives and their respective children. The wives meet regularly to discuss important family business. Baba Fuji is going to bring in the fish tomorrow. Yes, he told me. Will you come and sell it with me? All right. At the market, we could enlist the help of other women. If it's a good catch, we could sell it over two days. If we sell it all in one go, we'll make a loss. Yes, why not? So we agree then. Look closely, Hubert. Check the net for holes. I'm getting old. My sight isn't what it used to be. Here. Ah, uh, there's a hole there. Watch how I fix it. You thread this through here, and then you do it again. You see? Baba Fuji has six children, but it is Hubert, age 12, whom he has chosen to be his partner and successor 
in the art of traditional fishing. Any father who brings a child into the world wants that child to surpass him. I want him to learn well and to continue the tradition. I must pass on all that I know so that he can enhance the family's reputation. Early Tofino people settled here because they were pursued by the Adja people for slavery. They found refuge in the middle of the lake, thanks to the deities that protected them. This is where they found peace, so they called this place Ganvie, which means, I was rescued here. Ganvie, which rescued the Tofanu people from the slave hunters in the 18th century, remains the sole refuge of a people with a very special language and way of life that has withstood the standardization of the modern world. Hubert, wake up. Time to get up. Come on. It's five in the morning. The floating market at Gonvier is in full swing. The fishermen come here for supplies before their working day on the lake. Uh, sell me some of that. I want a hundred francs worth of moyo. Also a hundred francs worth of akasa. Wait, and I'll pay you. More than fishermen, the Tofano people are sea farmers. All around Gonvier, they keep fish farms, which are like sea paddocks. When they planted palm leaves in their saltwater lake, they invented these akajars, or artificial mangrove swamps, which have provided them with a means of subsistence for three centuries. This is the net that needs changing. It's gone slack in the water. Look how dirty it is. Let's stop here. If we don't repair the net, we'll be in trouble. We might lose all the fish. After several months of waiting, Baba Fuji's akajar is ready to be harvested. Tomorrow, with the help of Hubert, who will accompany him for the first time, he plans to raise his first net. It's an important day in the year of a Tofanu fisherman. I'm going to tell you a story. As you know, the Akajas come from our ancestors. In their day, they didn't practice fish farming the way we do now. They fished with rods in front of their houses, and that was it. But one of them came up with the idea of planting branches in the mud to attract the fish. That's how this type of fishing started. It's like a home for the fish, because they can get food here which fattens them up. They dig holes and lay eggs here, and the fish grow up in the enclosure. When the time comes, we close the nets and lift out the fish. We'll see tomorrow. It's a good system. When they're not working on their akajars, the Tafanu people fall back on subsistence fishing. It's a technique called casting. Oh dear, I didn't cast that very well. That's no way to pass on the skill. 
There's nothing in it. I'll show you how it's done. You put your hand here like this. Look at my hand. Do you see? Do you see that? That's how you cast it. If you've prepared your net properly, it should be easy to cast. Look, if you gather it up wrong, the fish will escape. Now, this is like school. You should get a diploma for casting nets. Go on, Hubert, you take your net. Show me how you cast it. You see? You didn't prepare your net properly. Careful. I'm not sharing my fish with you. If you don't catch anything tonight, you'll have nothing to eat. Go on, try casting it here now. It takes a long time to learn how to cast a net. It's like learning the alphabet. You start with A and you go up to Z. You don't become a net caster overnight. It takes a lot of skill and patience. It is 10 o'clock, and Baba Fuji and Hubert are hurrying to get to church. It's Easter weekend, and there's an atmosphere of jubilation in Gonvier, day and night. Alongside the voodoo temples, Christians and Muslims have settled in this lakeside village. They all coexist in harmony. strong tides at the heart of this community, it is spirituality that keeps the Tofanu traditions alive. church? You were outside running around instead of staying inside with me. Did you see how we danced? We clapped our hands. Did you see? You should have stayed in church with everyone else and clapped your hands. We youngsters feel free in Gongvier. On my days off, I go fishing with friends. We earn a bit of cash. I love living on the water. And my dad is a good teacher. He's trying to give me a good education. He's a really good dad. But I'm not planning on making a living from being a fisherman. I'd rather get an apprenticeship in town and train to do something else. 
I don't want to be a fisherman all my life. The big day has come. The men have already tightened the nets around the part of the enclosure that they plan to harvest today. First, they must uproot the branches, which have served as a habitat for the fish for the past few months. This is to stop them from getting caught in the net. Check the branches thoroughly. I keep the oysters. I rinse them and put them to one side. I can sell those at the same time as the fish. You've been fishing with us since you were born. Your father says you don't want to make a living out of it. I'd rather do something else. I thought I might be a hairdresser. You know, Hibbert, the new rope is woven from the end of the old rope. That's our tradition. We've inherited it from our parents. If you don't pass it on, what are your children going to do? If I ever have any children, I'll let some of them be fishermen, but I'll send the others to school. That's what I would have liked for myself. Being a fisherman isn't for me. We close the net and push it down into the mud so the fish can't escape. We close it gently until we can lift it out of the water. It's not easy because the water's cold and the oysters cut our hands and feet to shreds. Not everyone can do this work. It's very challenging. After laboring for several hours, Baba Fuji and his men manage to gather the fish together at one end of the farm. It is the long-awaited moment of the fish harvest, the fruit of several months' work. <laughs> Adukon. One of Baba Fuji's wives is in charge of picking up the fish and taking them to the market to sell. God has given us these fish so we can only rejoice. And this is only the beginning. We plan to harvest all the fish, little by little, and we still have a month of fish farming ahead of us. Today's catch has been very good. It's a good omen. I'm really happy. Thanks to these Akaja, the Tofanu people in Gombe have found a way to preserve their identity for some time to come. Their future now depends on a generation which dreams of a life elsewhere and an easier way of life.
Lake Nokoe is just one of Benin's fragile marine areas and one of two main lakes, the other one being Lake Acheme. To the west of the country, at the mouth of the Mono River, which flows along the border with neighboring Togo, lies another fragile area, the Bouche du Roi. This protected 10,000 hectare estuary is an important stopover for migratory birds and the site of one of Benin's main mangrove swamps. Dean Akambi works for Eco Benin. He uses the association's meager funds to battle against overfishing and the illegal felling of trees, which has drastically reduced the size of this mangrove swamp. And yet the mangrove swamp is the coastal population's greatest asset. Rooted in the mud of the delta, these mangrove trees form a rampart against coastal erosion, which is breaking up the Atlantic coastline everywhere else. The fish eaten by humans spawn in their long, stilt-like roots, which also act as a fortress for the silt's underclasses. How can we convince the fishermen at the Bouche de Roi to protect their mangrove swamps? Perhaps by seeking inspiration from the past. Benin's forests are regarded today as sacred relics, either because they are inhabited by deities or because they offer resources used by the deities in various ceremonies. These forests are still here today because people's beliefs have stopped them from chopping down the trees. That has really contributed to the conservation of these forests. Dean and the Eco Benin Association have come up with a simple and genius idea to protect the mangrove swamp. They have declared it sacred. The Bouche de Roi region is one of the bastions of voodoo in Benin, and everyone respects the authority of the voodoo priests or Agbenon. Hello, Agbanon. Greetings. How are you? Wide right awake? How are the preparations going? Everything's ready? Everyone in the village is being informed? Yeah, everyone's waiting for you. Is it going to happen over there? On the other side. Fine, right, I'll follow you. Dean has found a powerful ally in the Zongbeto deity or night watchman. Considered to be the protector of the community, he is like the voodoo police, setting rules to maintain good relations between villagers and enforcing them. The deity is embodied by masks, which are brought out at the request of the priests. Reputed to be violent, Zongbeto instills fear in believers and a respect that is maintained by regular shows of strength in the form of small miracles. Hey, 
Some ash, but no burns. These two initiates are the first miracle survivors of the ceremony, but the demonstration isn't over yet. The deity has spoken. From now on, it is forbidden to cut down mangrove trees. Fishing in Akajas is forbidden. Nets are forbidden too in the area that we're going to make sacred. Anyone found breaking the rules will be arrested and tied up. They're tied up. They'll have to donate a sheep or a pig. They'll have to pick up a basket of gnats and a basket of mosquitoes. And on top of all that, they will have to pay a 120,000 franc fine or 80,000, depending on the mood of the deity. Zongbeto has spoken, and it will be the deity's followers spread all over the Bouche de Roi area who will enforce the rules he has announced. To mark out the sacred area, believers are placing images of their deity around the mangrove swamp. The place is now sacred. No one will dare to cut down the mangrove trees or fish the 500 hectares of sacred mangrove swamps. Gods and humans have united and become the sentinels of their natural habitat. The remains of great sacred forests, relics of a time when spirituality protected the environment, cover a third of the surface area of Benin. Further north, the landscape becomes a savanna, strewn here and there with rocky outcrops. In the west, the Atacora mountain range lies between Benin and neighboring Togo. It is in this dusty region, battered by the Harmaton desert wind, that the Somba people live. From an ancient past, when tribal wars were a regular occurrence, they have preserved their habitat, strongholds called Tata Samba. Nowadays, the Samba people live peacefully as subsistence farmers. They have never left the Tata Samba, around which all of their traditions are organized. The local landlord, called Basai, is also the community's healer. He is a medicine man who treats patients with plants and by invoking the spirits of the dead. These anxious parents have brought a young girl suffering from malaria to see him. Oh, 
Have you got the product I gave you earlier? Yeah, I have it with me. Give it to me. Quiet, darling. You're going to be all right. Add this powder to a bowl of stew and make her drink it. Do that for seven days and then come back so I can see if she is cured. My father and grandfather were healers. Before he died, my father left me this tata. It is this house which bestows good health on people because the soul of my father and that of my ancestors live on here. That gives me the power to heal people. For Samba people, their spirituality comes from the cult of their ancestors. The dead aren't really dead, as long as they are not forgotten. And each deceased individual, represented by a mound of earth, ensures the happiness and protection of the living. Downstairs, the Tatars are temples to these ancestors, and they also serve as sheepfolds. The roofs, which once contained bedrooms, now serve as grain stores for the winter. Father, it's my initiation ceremony tomorrow. I want to know what's going to happen. Dominique, I am not allowed to tell you. You must find out for yourself. But it's all part of growing up and becoming a man. And then what? Then you can take a wife and move into your own Tata. I'm ready. I'm glad to hear it. My father used to say, our lives begin in these Tatas. So you must keep your Tata the way our ancestors taught us. That's important because it will be the scene of all your ceremonies. The initiation of your future sons and daughters their weddings, and even your funeral. Those are our traditions. Basai's son, Dominique, has just turned 18. The Council of Elders has decided that tomorrow he will begin the rites of passage into adulthood. This week of initiation is a turning point in the life of a somber man. It is an obligatory step without which he cannot take a wife or play a role in this patriarchal society. When the time comes for him to leave, Dominique knows that he is engaging in a process from which there is no return. He will no longer live in the house that he was born in. Dominique, your initiation starts today. You have grown up. Receive the holy water, be well, and come back stronger. Your parents give you their blessing. When you return from this initiation ceremony, you will have changed. You will have grown up. Dominique goes off into the bush, where he will spend eight days being subjected to the secret initiation rituals performed by the chiefs. Meanwhile, everyone busies themselves doing up Dominique's new home. Like everywhere else in the world, Benin is turning towards individualist values. The Samba people are also undergoing this transformation with the noticeable outcome that the Tata Samba are being abandoned. They require an enormous collective effort of building and renovation. That is unpaid work that few people can afford. But luckily, in the village of Bukumbe, the values of solidarity live on. Villagers, neighbors, and family members have come to lend a hand to do up the Tata that Dominique will soon move into. In Samba tradition, 
After your initiation ceremony, you must go to your own tata and build a home for yourself. That's why we're doing up this tata for Dominique. The men do the building work, but we add a feminine touch. We women are in charge of maintaining and doing up the tatas. This place represents a link between life and death. Our spirits are hidden here. If this house disappears, our ancestors will disappear with it, and they won't be able to do any more for us. A week later, Dominique's Tata Samba is ready, just as he and two other boys emerge from their initiation ceremony. The adults take it in turn to carry the initiates on their shoulders before placing them on the ground to symbolize the passage to adulthood. From this moment on, they must stand on their own two feet. <laughs> Dominique and his fellow initiates leave the group and head off to make their Tata Samba their own. As a hangover from past wars, Dominique climbs onto the roof and scours his surroundings for enemies. From today, it is down to him to defend his home and his land. The symbolic fight the young men are engaging in is the final stage of initiation, proof that they are now capable of defending themselves without any help from their fathers. It is traditional for them to share a beer afterwards, to mark the end of the fight, and a newfound friendship amongst the young initiates. It also marks the start of the celebrations. I'm very proud of this celebration. When it is over, my son will be free. He has not transgressed once during his initiation. He has passed all the stages without failing. That makes me very happy. Life begins for the young man. Today I'm very happy. I used to live with my father, but now I'm a man. I'm sure I'll get married soon. The girls will think, there's a handsome boy who's come through his initiation rites in fine form. I've watched my father maintaining our traditions. He's kept them alive for me. And in turn, I'm ready to spend the rest of my life defending our land. When I bring a child into the world, I want to pass on all this knowledge. And that child will preserve the house of his ancestors too. An ancient culture 
devoted to the cult of its ancestors, lives on in the land of the Somba people. Here, like in the rest of Benin, spirituality is both a weapon and a tool to protect a precious and fragile heritage. <laughs>